Um, hi, everyone. Hello, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. This is, this is our special feature today, Spencer Ellsworth. Hi, Spencer. Hi, Juliet. <laughs> you were just saying a thing, so go on. I was just saying hi. I'm Spencer. Um, I've been writing for since I learned how, and my first novel came out in August from Tor.com, a short novel, as is standard with Tor.com. The sequel will be out this November 28th. And those are space opera. Which, and um, it's called Starfire, A Red Piece. And what's the second one called? The second one is called Shadow Sun 7. Starfire is just the series name. Um, okay. So A Red Piece, Shadow Sun 7. And the third one is called Memories Blade, and that'll be out. Uh, when will that be out? That will be out <coughs> on February 27th. So they come out right in a row. They're all very short. I mean, if you put them all together, you'd have about a... 500 to 600 page novel, but on their own, they're about 200 pages. I see. So they're sort of novella-ish. Yeah, they're, they they will feel a little bit like a, a long novella, but they barely qualify as novels. They're all about 50 to 60,000 words. Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Yeah. It's, apparently, I my editor told me to write a novella, and apparently I, I still had to go long. <laughs> No, that's cool. Um, so tell me again when, remind me again when Shadow Sun 7 comes out? November 28th. Yes. All right. I just want to make sure I have that in my report, and I will try to write that in the report before November 28th. <laughs> and Thank that you. way that will help you out. I appreciate so, um, that. So, so very cool. So this is a space opera. Mm -hmm. um, and it clearly has multiple points of view, so, so that's always fun. Um, Tell us a little bit about the, the world that, that you've got going on here. Okay. Um, it starts with, uh, it's set about 10,000 years in the future. It's set in a galaxy that's been fighting an interminable ongoing war against these, um, these really big spiders, giant space spiders. <laughs> okay. Planets. Nobody knows much about them. They eat planets and suns. And so uh, the, the leading government has created a class of genetically engineered soldiers to fight the space fighters, as one does. Uh, Custom-made okay. soldiers. And um, the official line has been that these soldiers aren't sentient. They didn't appreciate that. So when we start the novel, the soldiers have overthrown the empire. It's a brave resistance that's overthrown the empire. Uh -huh. I think you've all heard that line before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first thing they do after they overthrow the empire is they say, now we can do what we really want to do. We can kill all the humans. Okay. So, so we, our main characters are, there's a, a genocide and a purge going on. There's a mysterious peace with the space spiders that is not all it seems to be. Because um, as you all know, uh, we, we can coexist with spiders um, until, we, uh, until we bump into them. Until, <laughs> yeah. It, um, so there's sort of a, how are we, what is, what is behind this piece, what's going on? There's a, a genocide, and the main characters are a smuggler who gets involved in saving some of these humans who are targeted, and a soldier who starts to realize that his orders are terrible orders, unconscionable orders. And, yeah, it's, it should be a lot of fun. I've heard people say so both, of the, both of these two characters are actually part human and part something else, right? Yeah, the, both of the characters are, are the genetically engineered soldiers. It's just that one has um, one has left that life behind. She's been living as a smuggler because her parents were, um, <laughs> as her, her parents uh, escaped that life. Uh -huh. And then the other one is a, an active duty soldier who's seeing the some of the problems with um, his orders, although he, he tends to see the problems and then turn around and get high to forget about the problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he spends a lot of the book doing that. Well, you know, when you have a really thorny problem on your hands, sometimes sometimes people turn to self-medication to deal with that. So yeah, uh, That's an objection of realism into your space opera right there. <laughs> that's right. It's an attempt. You know, I, I kind of think of it as a, having a similar tone to the X-Men comics in that there can be a lot of echoes of, uh, of real issues in the world, and then there can be a giant firebird that wants to eat your planet. <laughs> yeah, I was actually noticing that um, with the kill all the humans sort of 
um, echoes of X Men Two in it. In yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, I uh, I take no credit for you know I I will wear my influences on my sleeve there. I'm it's sure cool. That. I like. I mean, X Men are awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. So um, so this is cool. Um, I'm actually. I have a question now. Yeah. Uh, so do your do your you know space soldiers and giant space spiders actually read X Men? Are they fans of Wolverine? Are they? Dark <laughs> yeah. They do read comic books. Comic books figure into the second one. Hey, there you go. What's that? Um, superhero a, comics or war comics? Like you know. There's a sort of, um, there's a sort of folk hero sheriff, space sheriff. Everyone's read the comics about this person and. Um, it turns out this person is not as made up as they appear to be, uh, but that's all I'll say. So, I yeah, like it. I couldn't, you know, I, I love comics, so I couldn't write about characters <laughs> who didn't read comics. And that just... It's very interesting, though. It's sort of meta. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. Have a little fun with the... Well, you know, it's funny, because people do say that people in... Um, people in... Science fiction don't usually read science fiction, but so at least your guys are reading comics, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that was the goal. Um, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna dig a little bit further on your genetically engineered soldiers. Where did their other DNA come from? So their other DNA comes from this uh, legendary race that's supposedly dead and supposedly extinct. When this when the space spiders came into the picture a thousand years ago they disrupted a whole intergalactic empire. And our, our empire, we start with, is a much smaller, contracted, uh, revised version of that. Okay. Um, a lot of their, their faster than light points have been lost to the spiders. A lot of the, the network they used to get from star to star has been disrupted. Um, and so there was this race uh, they call the Jorians. That, uh, it, they attribute all sorts of legendary things to them. Oh, there's these Jorian ruins. No one knows how they made them. Oh, they they terraformed all the planets. All sorts of legendary things are attributed to the Jorians. And um, the soldier's DNA um, supposedly comes from whatever remaining Jorian DNA exists. Huh. Um, and that's how, the, that's how the soldiers are supposedly... There's more to the story than that. And like all yeah. fallen empire narratives, there's more to it than there appears to be. Well, you know, it's it's got it, it's got a little bit of that. Um, let me let me switch this around. Um, I always appreciate it when a world has a history, right? Um, like in Lord of the Rings, when you see the ruins of whatever was there before, you know that this place has a history. So it's nice to have something like that where you go, yes, this this empire has a history, you know, and it's fun to actually have a real history that will interact with the with the current. Um, events. Yeah, thanks. So. I tend to fall less on the hard sci-fi end and more on the fantasy and space and, you know, <laughs> Durian DNA. They taste really good but smell unbelievably bad. Yes, exactly, Brian. <laughs> but if, if you like, uh, you know, if you were a fan of Dune, where, where in space can give you the power to travel faster than the light, I tend to write that sort of science fiction where you can feel a bit like it's a um, more fan. It's in space, but it's a it's on the more fantastical side rather than the um, <clears throat> the, sure. the hard sci-fi side. But I I did try to make sure that you know things were accounted for. You can't just take a walk out in space and not freeze. <laughs> right. You can't invoke the force and be able to breathe vacuum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not that you can do that in Star Wars either. I was just like, <laughs> wait, did, did that happen? Did I miss something? <laughs> <laughs> I, I must have slept through that bit of one of the movies. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> miss, maybe Star it's in Wars the US. Has now, of us. now we'll see it in, in The Last Jedi, and you're going like, oh my god, how did I know that? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I'm, uh, my prescience. <laughs> anyway, okay, cool. And um, so, how many humans are are there around 
Like how does how do this how does the social balance play out? Now we're gonna now we're gonna kill all the humans. What's the ratio and, and how does that interaction take place? Well the humans are the they're the despised upper class. They're the, the oligarchs. Um, because the, the infamous Jorians supposedly had an alliance with the humans and those were the those were the great upper class of this first empire. Ooh. So you can be very proud of having pure human DNA in this world. Uh, you can make a you usually have a, a a nice pedigree along bloodline. The uh -huh. I was looking a little bit at. I was very inspired by the Russian Revolution in particular. Yeah. So yeah, I was looking at something in which there's a, a very sympathetic resistance force, and um, they've got a very uh, legitimate grievance and. If you lived at the time, you know, if you and I lived in Russia in, in 1914, we probably would have been um, Mensheviks or Bolsheviks. And, uh, and then, you know, some of these people like Vladimir Lenin turned, turned really ruthless. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, some made an opportunity for really ruthless people to rise within the party and create a worse oligarchy. Um, and so that's what I was looking at was the idea of, uh, so it's sort of a, it's an empire that subsists on having a disposable soldier class. Yeah. And, and the humans in particular are at the top of that subsistence that rests on the disposable soldiers. That's uh, creepily like an all-volunteer army that's economically motivated. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I have lived the last 15 years in a country that has a a soldier class and uh, perpetual <laughs> warfare. So I can't promise you that that didn't make its way into that. That wasn't part of the inspiration. Um, in particular, my, my dad works for the Marines. He's a PTSD therapist for the Marine Corps. It's a tough job. And, and uh, the soldier character was really inspired by some conversations that we had, my dad and I. Cool. Neat. My, my dad was in Korea and my uncles were in World War II, but that was a different time and situation. It is. Yeah, it's interesting. You see, there's a big difference. You know, the, uh, is the, the average World War II vet has spent something like 40 days average in combat, in, a com in combat zones. Not necessarily in combat, but 40 days in combat zones. I mean, Matt, it's several, it's many, many orders of magnitude higher for uh, Afghanistan and Iraq veterans coming back the amount of time they spend in combat zones and you know, a lot of time they just re they re-enlist um, <coughs> different time but I will I'll stick to the book for now <laughs> yeah well I mean I didn't want to derail the book but I wanted to you know world building doesn't come out of pure theory Right? It comes out of the author's experience as well as, as the author's thoughts about the world. Yeah, yeah. That was big. And I think that was, uh, especially, I wrote the, the first book in 2014, and I wrote the sequels, you know, on commission. They were, I told, I left the first book open, and I had kind of a vague idea of what would happen in books two and three, and I developed it over the years, but was when my agent came back and said they want all three books that I was like, okay, and that was... <laughs> and here we go! <laughs> yeah. So I wrote, I wrote the, the drafts and the first big revisions of the second and third book from August 2016 to February of 2017. You can imagine that had a... That was a tumultuous time. That's, yeah, that's impressive. I was because I was going to ask about that because you know they've come out in fairly rapid succession and I remember when you know the tour announcement came out that you know we bought Spencer Ellsworth's trilogy and everyone was like, woo. And I'm like, did you write that all before they bought it? Or was it <laughs> yeah, so now yeah. I know the answer? <laughs> no, I didn't. And oh gosh, writing on commission really, it almost broke my brain at first. Mm. Really, it's really tough to uh to have a deadline and to have a word count goal um that's not self-imposed and to step back and be like well, how do I have fun? How do I relax and get a draft out in time? And I, gosh, I wrote and threw away the beginning of the second book three or four times. Wow. And I had a full draft and I still went back and threw away the beginning and wrote a new beginning. Uh, it just, 
I, I had a full draft and I went back and read a red piece and was like, the ending of the first book doesn't match up to the beginning of the second book at all. Okay. And um, I suppose if I'd had more time and had my druthers, I would have kept throwing it away and rewriting it and throwing it away and rewriting it. But that way lies madness. I think the second book came out. Okay. That, you know, <laughs> there you go. And George R. R. Martin, I think. <laughs> Chase says, I'm on the fourth ish opening in my novel, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. The, the important thing is not how many openings you have to your novel, it's how many endings you have to your novel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What? No, there's only one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I felt the same way, Che. I got the ending of the second no, book I... right and the, the beginning just over and over. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's sequels are tricky point. anyway because you have to in a way resume without uh, without acting like you're resuming <laughs> you know there are, it has a lot of jobs that it has to do the beginning of a second book um because it has to do the job of here we are in case you're here for the first time and and it has to be the beginning of a book it can't be the middle of a longer um a longer work so yeah, yeah. To middle middle books of trilogies are notorious <laughs> for uh, for not actually having a beginning or an ending. <laughs> so, it, the thing that really one thing that really helped me was to think about each book in terms of what kind of story it was. The first book was a chase, so I was like, well, the second book can't have that same chase structure, right? Uh, you know, a Clash of Kings is a war book, a Game of Thrones is a politics book, um, Wild Seed is a antagonist. Uh, wrestle well mind of my mind is about building a different community you know a different first and second books have to be different so i i thought the second book has to be some sort of caper or infiltration story mm. and um the third book was a little easier because that was just going to be the the one in which there were a lot of big spectacular battles but so that helped me get a handle on it was to think well it's going to be a caper um yeah, because once you have that, you have a certain kind of structure that you're, you can aim for. Yeah, having that structure really helped because I knew I, knew I had to get characters to, to certain points in the second book. And uh, my efforts to write it stream of consciousness weren't working. But as soon as I had that structure, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, oh, well, what, what are they breaking into? Oh, they're breaking into prison. Why are they breaking into prison? Well, they need to know this by the end of the book, so... They're going to know this by breaking out a prisoner who knows this in the prison. How do they know, they know about that prisoner? Oh, okay, well, how do they get their resources? What's the prison in? Of course, it's built in the shell of a giant space tick. That, <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> that flies up to spaceships and sucks the air out of them. So it's actually got a very profitable stash of these little um, oxygen, de super dense um, oxygen cells that I just made up th that are in its... Uh, in its in its leftover lungs that the miners in the prison cut out of there and once i had that as that prison is the the focal point for the entire book then it got really fun and that's yeah you know, that's another thing you, you have to get to the point where you're playing and you're having fun and you're not perceiving it as commission but yeah yeah commission do you, is tough. Uh, sorry do you uh typically do uh, like a lot of discovery writing as, as you were talking it made me wonder if do you usually do a lot of plotting or was this kind of an interesting Ooh. deviation from your normal way of, uh, of creativity I have been plotting more and more Brian the 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 more I write the more I plot and a red piece was the most tightly not plotted novel I've ever written I had literally like gone through and um, kind of blocked through block through some of the scenes and had a really detailed outline. Um, so I am plotting more and more as I go on and discovery writing, at least under commission, just was a, a nightmare and I had to go back and, and tighten the plot. Yeah. So I guess I'm a plotter and sort of a born again plotter because I've done quite a bit <laughs> of discovery writing, but I'm at the point where I know if I have a really tight plot, I can produce a book under deadline. If I don't, then it'll just be discovery. Yeah, interesting. So uh, in a sort of world-building sense, one of the other things that you worry about in sequels, besides the beginnings and the endings and the genre, is you have to expand the world. You just can't not do that. 
So um, when you wrote the first one, you, you did wrote it as a standalone one, open-ended, and then you, when you sat down to write, you got commissioned for two and three at the same time, so you knew you were going to have three. So how did you approach, like, okay, i got to expand the world and make it bigger in some way uh, while simultaneously doing all those other things? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, you know, rereading the first one, it was pretty easy to see the things that were seated that people would be curious about in the larger world. It's easier for me to see the places where I faked it like, oh man, I really just threw that in there. <laughs> I didn't even know what was going on there. And uh, so for instance, I never explained how people, you know, there were things like I never explained how people talked faster than light. I assumed it worked on the same system that was letting them move their ships through these faster than light nodes. So I said, okay, well, I'll come up with something cool. There will be a big, a big tower on a planet, and that's how you send faster than light messages. The tower connects to the the faster than light node in orbit. <laughs> and then I had, of course, then I had a cool sequence in which our characters have to hijack the tower to send a message. It'll travel faster than light. Um, and so just little things like that. Where's the holes? Where was I faking it to look cool? And then what, what's a genuine thing? people might want to know uh, a lot more about, I think. And luckily, I seeded some things. You know, I think there's a, there's a passage in the first book in which they talk about how the glorious resistance is broke, and they're offering letters of credit to all these financial backers, and the letters of credit are worthless. And so we had, we had some fun. In the second book, I said, okay, well, I, I sort of extrapolated that more and more into... Um, uh, in the second book, they actually leverage that. They, they, you know, there's a, there's a reward out for the main character's heads, and at one point they leverage it like, you know that reward is a letter of credit that's totally worthless. And then, <laughs> so the space goombas in, in question come back and be like, well, what else did you have in mind? And, um, you know, so, yeah. But there were definitely places where I was like, you didn't know what you were doing there, Spencer, did you? <laughs> You but know. now you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I tried to fill in as much as possible. One of the things that helped was I was reading The Expanse while I was writing the second one. And so I was like, okay, you need a bare minimum of scientific rigor if this is, this is uh, you know, you need to make sure you're not leaning too hard on the space fantasy. Like artificial gravity in Star Wars, they never explain it. It's just there. But I, I explained. I tried to make artificial gravity a, a, a typical it breaks down and it works a certain way and it does certain things and and uh, we only use it to uh, to keep from bone loss and muscle loss that would happen in zero gravity uh, without thrust and anyway I tried I tried to uh, and tried to explain that a little more rigor as well Sorry. cool <laughs> Well, so other questions about the book before we, um, or books, before we um, move on to topic number two? <laughs> Sounds like we've got a lot, of, we've already had a lot of cool questions, so. So, um, I know that when I first spoke to him about being a guest on the show, Spencer was like, you want to have me come on and talk about outdoors and wilderness survival, don't you? And I'm like, well, I was thinking of having you talk about your book, but we can also. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, thank you for humoring me and talking about your book, Spencer. <laughs> no, I like talking about the book. We can talk about the book more. I just have an area of expertise that actually has nothing to do with space opera. Well, very little. Well, I think, I think it would be an interesting transition at this point. So, let's, so, so tell, us, tell us why this is your big thing. Wilderness survival, right? Um, I just, when I was a kid, I got sent, I was a snotty teenager, and I got sent to one of those wilderness camps in the Southwest. Mm. And um, it was a, it was actually a rather good one. There's some, uh, there's some really questionable ones. Um, but this one was one of the oldest ones. It was quite good. It had a very non-confrontational approach. So I enjoyed it, and I came back and worked there when I was older. Worked there on and off. For five years, but that's five years I was going to college, so I would take a semester off or a summer off and work there. And it was in Arizona, um, so generally desert, but uh, especially you know desert where there was 
good water because we can <coughs> we could use the groundwater. Some of the other programs have to truck in their water, but we were able to use our we were able to drink the water there, which was really nice. Wow, that's cool. Where, whereabouts? Um, the program is based out of Mesa. The hiking was in the I was they they did several areas, but at the time I did it, we would in this winter we would do Bloody Basin near the Horseshoe. Uh, reservoir and the Verde River and then in the summer we would go up by Young along the Cherry Creek Basin um, in fact we would just kind of make a circle around the tiny town of Young and try not to let the students know that there was a town there <laughs> a lot of those kids were court ordered there and some of them would run away and they would get to the town and it's Young's <laughs> a teeny tiny town and everyone there knew if they saw a dirty teenager running through there it's an escapee and then it's Ozzy. <laughs> So that sounds like it ties into the prison breakout and uh, <laughs> maybe even giant spiders. Uh, we <laughs> have spiders in that area and that sort of thing. So this maybe has stronger connection than you even realize. Yeah, there were tarantulas. I, I remember everyone was afraid to pick up tarantulas except this, um, this vegan kid who just had a, a real love for animals. And we all, you know, we all thought it was notable that he was vegan because, uh, uh, we we ate one of our one of our sources of flavoring out there was chicken bouillon, and they gave him some sort of vegan flavoring. And um, he he would always pick up the tarantulas. The rest of us, I think, were too scared to. But yeah, they come They're out. Cute and furry. Yeah, <laughs> they come out and sun themselves on the rocks. To rattlesnakes, scorpions. A kid ate a scorpion. I, I knew a kid. I saw a kid, you know, toss in the fire and pop off its claws and tail and take a bite. It's tasted like a really sour shrimp. Must must be bigger than the scorpions we get. That's <laughs> tiny. There's no no nourishment in one of those at all. Sure wasn't a vinegaroon. Those are huge, but Yeah, it was it was pretty tiny, but you wouldn't want to eat a vinegaroon, just you know, vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> the How clues in the name. So uh what can do you want me to ask answer questions? Do you want me to talk a little bit about things to think about if you have characters? Who yeah, are getting... I think things to think about if you have characters is, is the yep. direction okay. I'd want to go. So every every survival in every biome is different. Um, I know the the desert pretty well. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the main things to to remember is that uh, food and water run out, and your characters will eat way less, way fewer calories than. Um, than they would. We're used to eating a huge amount of calories. Yeah. I mean, and the amount it would when we would bring out uh, food packs for that weekly program, it was just a huge bag full of lentils and macaroni and rice. And and what had happened was they had calculated how many calories teenagers need in a day. And we're, we're talking about like, you know, when we're talking about <clears throat> calorie counting, we're talking about like uh, the recommended. Minimum, but most of us eat more than that. Most of us get m way more saturated fats and way more carbohydrates. And so, anytime you turf characters out into the desert, uh, roots and berries are a very minimal amount of calories. Fish and game take a while to clean, and a while. And um, I never managed to make a decent like boomerang, bow and arrow. I tried. All those things uh, require. A lot of trial and error to get right and of course never turf a character out in the desert without a knife you know you need a knife to do anything I mean sometimes you just uh, you need a knife to you know just to make a spoon even if you've got food and you're cooking it over a fire you need a knife to make a spoon and um, <coughs> that was one relief with working with at-risk teenagers by the way is they were all cleared to have a knife so we never had any. We never had any students who were terribly unstable. But um, so that the, there's that's a basic thing to think about is that consuming, finding, and consuming food takes up. It would take up your entire day if your characters have to get somewhere. Uh, hopefully, they have a food source. But um, yeah, I have read novels where characters get by on roots and berries, and it's just yeah. <clears throat> Even in the height of uh, berry season, you have to eat a lot of berries <laughs> to 
get your daily calories. You have to eat, and you have to eat a lot of leaves. I did. We would do what we called primitives, where you would try like three days um, without your food pack. So uh, one of the times I did a primitive, we killed a rattlesnake and we ate that, and that didn't go very far. And you have to kind of eat the ribs too. Um, the meat is okay, but you have to eat the ribs if you're going to eat a snake. And uh, that that part is not nearly as much fun as eating regular meat. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> But it was, it was the height of crawdad season. Arizona has a real problem with invasive crayfish because they were dropped there as feeders and they actually outcompeted the trout. Um, and so you could catch as many crayfish as you wanted. But, and and we, we basically had grape leaves, crayfish, and this rattlesnake. And we just weren't getting, you know, after a few days we were all exhausted because we just weren't getting a lot of calories. We weren't oh, yeah. getting a lot of carbohydrates. There's a reason why when bread was invented, everyone settled down in the same place so they could keep making bread. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, you know, realistically, if you want characters to survive in any kind of... And every biome is different, right? In the Pacific Northwest, I wouldn't know what to do because everything is so saturated. My tactics of making a fire with a bow drill set or a hand drill set would be really difficult. I, I would not have the so if you know if I was surviving the Pacific Northwest, I would want someone who knows how to find dry wood. There are tricks to that. There are places where you can find, you know, stuff that's avoided saturation because it's been in some secluded area. But I wouldn't know where to look for that. Right. I could go to Arizona and I, I could tell you, you know, five uses for a yucca plant. But there's no yucca plants near my house now. I would be totally lost if I was unless it was the middle of summer. I would be totally lost. Yeah. So there's a lot of shows like uh, Man, Survival Man, Man vs. Wild, Man vs. Whatever. Um, if I was trying to do some research based on some shows, are any of them that you've seen better than others? I mean, what are some really good examples of good survivor like uh, wilderness uh, training that we could use? I don't actually watch those. Um, <laughs> I don't watch much TV at all. Uh, the Gary Paulson classics, Hatchet and those, those are quite good. Um, I was actually really close friends with uh, Gary's, uh, Gary Paulson's son. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gary Paulson is kind of a wilderness enthusiast anyway, isn't he? He actually likes to... Um, well, I think he lived in uh, New Mexico. Um, that's where I met his son. And uh, yeah, I, I think... I actually didn't meet Gary himself, so I'm not sure how much of a survivalist he was. Yeah. Um, but there's quite a lot of wilderness skills groups um, and quite a lot of people who are really devoted to wilderness skills. Um, <coughs> just Google any Google wilderness skills group and you'll come up with... Let me find where the chat is in this. Uh, where is the chat? I don't know where the chat is. Where's my chat window? Oh. It's on the left. It's on the left now. Okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. Like getting it on is on the left. Yeah. And it's the top icon. And if you hit that, your chat will come back. And so I, this is what I just found Googling a list of wilderness skills meetups, um, wilderness skills classes. Uh, there's quite a lot of programs like that. Um, if you've ever seen the film Jeremiah Johnson, old Robert Redford film, the uh, uh -huh. guy who founded the program I worked at was the wilderness advisor on that. That's got some really accurate uh, wilderness skills in it. But I've not seen the TV shows, but I suspect, I suspect <laughs> the TV shows are similar to the program I worked at in that people weren't just left to... They they film the part where you they film the part where you go and try to find edibles in the park and try to make your own skills, <coughs> <clears throat> and then you probably get a cup of rice and beans or something to uh, make sure you have enough calories in you off camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. that's like um. So how much conceivably do you have to carry? Um, to survive 
well, like if your characters are going from one place to another and you were hopefully smart enough to bring supplies with you, um, you're, you're talking, I'm, I'm assuming, in, in the pounds of rice and beans and lentils and possibly yeah. having to bring your own water or filtration system. Yeah, it depends. It depends where whether the water is safe. If you're writing fantasy, most of the people in the medieval <clears throat> Renaissance eras would have had parasites anyway, and they would have just drank the water unless they were, um, the unless they lived, you know, were near major urban centers where people, where uh, sewage drained into the water. But just a second here, I need to plug in my computer. Uh, talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> I'm still over here taking notes. <laughs> okay. we, just, we just can't have dead air, so someone should tap dance or put in his hands. Ca carrying water. So, well, um, carrying um, water is very heavy. Carrying water is a major, major problem. Uh, right. Most yeah. people who do any wilderness hiking, you know, long distance stuff, will take a small filtration device because you cannot carry enough water for you to drink. Uh, particularly in desert environments for any significant length of time it's just not possible yeah yeah dry camping is dry camping is really quite uh, a scary endeavor uh, you'll probably wake up dehydrated and you'll probably have to start hiking dehydrated and being dehydrated anywhere in the wilderness especially in the desert is um, is really it's genuinely dangerous yeah, we used to say our motto, like whatever, I don't remember the, what the motto of the program was, but we used to say that the, the unofficial motto was drink more water. We used to, anyone would say, I have a headache, I have a stomach ache, and we're like, how much water have you drank? Can you get down yeah. two canteens and then see how you feel? And yeah. uh, there's um, one of the best descriptions I've ever read of um, how bad the desert is. It's actually in um, Luis Alberto Llorez, uh, The Devil's Highway. It's actually a book about illegal immigration across the border, but it's across the border through the desert. And it goes into a lot of detail about how unprepared people are in the desert, how much it can kill you, just how dangerous it is without you knowing about it. I would strongly recommend it. What's, can you write that in the chat bar? I will write that in the chat bar. Yeah, yeah, that was like a lot of Spanish. <laughs> yeah, um, but in terms of, uh, uh, Che, I think, asked me about weight. Uh, your backpack is probably going to be 50, 60 pounds when it's full of enough food, enough calories to feed you for the week. You're going to want, you can compact some of that if you have access to a lot of oily foods uh, because those are really high calorie. Um, so if you had like a character like Aragorn, if you went through Aragorn's backpack when he's a ranger, he's probably got quite a lot of rendered down fat from the animals he kills. And he probably just eats the fat because it's high in calories, oh, wow. and uh, it's, yeah, he probably is, um, and he probably uses it to cook other things, his roots and berries, because of the the, uh, the amount of calories he would get from it. Um, yeah, fat, fat is, is the high energy, dense food source, so yeah. yes. And uh, probably some sort of dry, flat bread, um, is the sort, again, if Aragorn could get that, he would carry that sort of thing. You don't want you want a uh, very dry bread that would not mold as easily. Um, but if you can get a complex carbohydrate source, you want it. Roots and berries. Again, roots and berries are uh, going to be an issue. I think, I think in Lord of the Rings, I mean, that's why Tolkien invented Lembus. So they had this magic food supply that basically, you know, just a, a single bite was enough to keep you going for days at a time and stuff. And even right. the hobbits got bored of it in the end. It makes sense um, because of Tolkien being a World War One veteran and knowing about how uh, how calories would have been parceled out and measured for the the troops. He would have basically. I think that's why he eventually just said, "No, the hobbits can't carry enough sausages and potatoes." <laughs> yeah. What what form do the fats take? I mean, is it just like um, it's like sticks of butter, like? Almost, except it's just like animal fat, or um, I mean, and do you do you like do something with it? Because I've seen like um, I think it was on Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmern where he was in Alaska, and there was basically this thing where it was berries and some kind of lard, 
<laughs> just mixed together and that was and you ate it because yeah um and i'm sure they got it from the inuit i think it was like a couple white guys he was out with but um it was it was just this um like that was the thing it was like this fat mixed with berries and that was your food and you just had to eat it that sounds about right yeah we we would um we got sunflower seeds which were fatty and we got on the program uh, we made sure the kids got sunflower seeds powdered milk um some powdered creamer so all all sort of fatty foods that you could carry so seeds if you can find fatty seeds or if you're writing fantasy you can invent nuts uh nuts especially fat any fatty nut is gonna um be really beneficial but um they tend don't tend to travel well or store well in the damp you know they they go sour and sprout um so just a just a second here are we waiting for juliet to come back oh i didn't know she left wow it, yeah it looks like she was having some internet problems i bet she'll yeah, be back she just, pretty she soon. just muted out yeah that happens it's google hangouts is kind of crappy we're, we're still being recorded so we're good we can carry yeah. on okay yeah. so yeah um you know that scene in the Lord of the Rings, the movie. I think it's in the only in the extended version, but there's a scene where Aragorn gets a deer and he walks up to their camp with a deer. That would be the next. I think like the next thirty hours of Aragorn's life would be nothing but yeah. figuring out how much nutrition he could get from that deer. And so he wouldn't just strip off the meat. He'd have to strip off the meat and he'd have to smoke it. He'd have to build a smokehouse. He'd want to render down the fat. He'd uh, want to. He'd want to smoke as much of the organ meat as he could, and he'd want to eat as much of the organ meat um, as he couldn't smoke because it would uh, before it spoiled. And he would want to <laughs> strip the hide, and um, yeah, that that deer would have like the ring race probably would have caught him in the <coughs> thirty to forty hours straight he'd spend just processing the deer. Wow. Um, or presumably he just killed the deer and they just ate some of it and left the deer as a waste. Um, but I would be very mad at Aragorn for wasting uh, an entire deer like that. The, when the um, uh, big wagon trains were going across the, the West um, on their, you know, mighty, mighty journey to the Pacific, um, they would kill buffalo, um, yeah. and they would, but they wouldn't preserve any of the meat. They would simply just eat what they, you know, could get right there and that was it and oh, then yeah, next day no. they just shoot another buffalo because they were buffalo you know every time they saw them they would just shoot a buffalo eat some fresh meat and carry on and all these carcasses yeah. were just left this is this is the part in which um, we explain that indigenous ways of life are usually sustainable and colonizers ways of life are usually not yep <laughs> because there's there's a reason why you know natives who understood uh why comanche and, and apache and uh and the Sioux tribes understood and actually managed buffalo herds and understood how to use the entire thing because you know they you needed a certain uh, you needed a certain population threshold for the herd to stay the same size. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they they like, also changed their ways of dealing with it bef um, before and after they had horses available because they were using buffalo in some ways before the horses, but their hunting methods changed significantly once um, horses were introduced by the Spanish. Yeah. So if you're if you're um, a vegetarian, it can be pretty hard to do wilderness survival because people get hungry enough. They'll go kill a cute little bunny, and they'll they'll not only cook all the tiny bit of meat on the bunny, they'll crack the bones and suck the marrow. They'll chew the bones. Um, they'll uh, they'll eat the organs. You know, if you um, if you kill something, you you spend quite a lot of time, uh, and and that's your only food sport source. It's and you can afford it, you'll want to stop and process as much as the animals you can, especially for, like I said, uh, getting some sort of fatty uh, source of calories to carry with you, like rendered rendered lard. Or um, you could you could smoke fatty meat, but I think uh, it doesn't. The fat doesn't smoke terribly well. You get more use out of it if you render. It. So Which is what's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, it's why it's usually um, beef and pork and not lamb that we tend to smoke and turn into sausages and stuff. The more fat content mm. uh, mixed in with the meat, the harder it is to preserve. Right, yeah. So how long, if you're, on, if you're traveling, and let's say you have access to fresh water, 
for whatever reason. How long would it take if you're lucky enough, you wake up, you see uh, an animal, mid-sized animal, kill it with some ray gun or gun or bow and arrow right away. How long would it take to fix everything? I got to answer the kid. Uh, I, I think it would probably take you about um, two days. You're looking at like a, because if you've got to smoke it, um, you're looking at like a, a 20, 30, 40 hour process, depending if you're using everything. If you're going to smoke it, if you're going to scrape the hide, if you're going to wow. eat, <laughs> eat, um, eat the organs and render the fat. A long process. Now, if you're writing science fiction where you're on an alien planet, you can also have hand wavium for making a smokehouse. You know, well, we, we can use our power cells um, to burn this, this thing at a steady constant rate and we don't have to build a fire and bank it. Uh, we can just stick it in there and uh, leave it alone. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm wondering because, like, you see, like, um, at least nowadays you have, like, the big, the barbecue thing on wheels that does all the smoking thing. So, like, conceivably, it seems like you could have settlers who build and just take along <laughs> a sort of mobile smokehouse on wheels so you don't have to build the thing every single time. Yeah, you know, where I live in the Pacific Northwest, um, tribes would have, tribe, tribes would move to different fishing sites. And once they got there, they would build a smoke, they would build the smokehouse and stay there. And they would use the smokehouse to smoke out all the catch there. And they would not rebuild the smokehouse at the other site until they got to the other site. So in theory, yeah, if you're writing fantasy and people have access to like horses and carts, they can, they can bring different tools to preserve it, you know, if they make a, if they had like plaster, some sort of plaster or, or anything they could cast or clay at the last area they were at. Of course, if you put a clay <coughs> oven in a hand cart, then you're using a uh, space you can have for utensils and, and cloth. And yeah, also clay tends to crack if the hand cart goes like this, which it does. <laughs> not, yeah. the hand, not the hand cart, but like an ox cart and, and a hand yeah. cart. <laughs> oh, calories, that's the main thing. Calories, all right. <laughs> well, we are, we are very close to the end. I lost internet there for a while, so I'm, I'm missing some notes from some of the things that I, I presume you were discussing. But what I, I'm, hoping that the, um, I'm hoping that the video will have captured it, and so I can go back and find it later. Um, to, to, to make sure I have a, a uh, report without massive gaps in it. Um, yeah, you should. <laughs> last, last thoughts. I mean, calories, that's what you need is kind of a good... Um, clothes, do keep in mind that uh, clothes degrade. Uh, mm. Again, a thing with killing animals, you, you, could, um, you can shave bone awls out of the more solid uh, bones, the ones that have more bone mass. Um, you can shave down a bone awl that works as an okay needle. It's it's about three times the size of a sewing needle, but uh, yeah. especially if you're if you're curing the hide, um, and you can also make sinew from an, from animal tendons or just sinew from uh, plants if you know how to use it. If you can find the right plants, yuccas. Uh, <laughs> There's your yuccas again. There's your, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yucca make an amazing amount of things out of a yucca plant. <laughs> you can't. Yuccas are incredibly useful. They make they make the best hand drills and bow drills as long as you can find one that's not got uh, bugs eating out the core. I was the bear grass yucca bugs always ate the core, but we could find sawtooth yucca sometimes that had a really good texture for making fires. How interesting! Interesting to me, anyway. <laughs> no, I think it's fascinating stuff. This is great. So. Um, well, thank you. Um, it, 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 because I had to find my way back in, I, I, I got a little off track, but, but thank you for being here. I will go and catch up and, and, and do homework if, if I can <laughs> and make sure I don't have a big gap in my notes. Um, but this has all been quite fascinating, and, and I hope that you have a lot of people reading your books, Spencer. So. Um, can I do a brief self promo and just give you guys a link to the Amazon page? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. It's okay. very easy to Google. I have I have Googled it several times. Yeah, I um 
Let's see, where's the trilogy page? You can just, I mean, you can just go look at the really pretty covers also. They are very, very pretty. There we go. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say one more thank you to Spencer, and I'm going to stop the broadcast, and then we can chat afterwards if you like.